Hello, this is Richard Thornton. Welcome to our continuing series on the ancient civilizations of Mexico. Today we head to the southern part of Mexico, to the state of Tabasco. The state of Tabasco is bordered on the north by the Gulf of Mexico, to the northeast by the state of Campeche, to the south by the state of Chiapas, to the southwest by the state of Oaxaca, and to the northwest by the state of Veracruz. All of the state of Tabasco is located south of the Tropic of Cancer, therefore as a tropical climate. The northern portion uh, near the Gulf of Mexico looks very similar terrain-wise to the Gulf Coast of the United States. Tabasco and bordering portions of the adjacent states of Veracruz and Chiapas are the locations are the oldest known civilizations in Mexico, at least that is the opinion today of archaeologists. Here, one finds the what is called the Olmec Civilization, the Epi-Olmec Civilization, the Gulf Coast Civilizations, and some of the earliest Maya cities. This video was made possible by an endowment set up by architect Sid Barrett in 1969 and it continues to this day. The original concept of the Barrett Fellowship was quite different than today, which mainly consists of small stipends to assist students in studies overseas. Uh, my project was conceived as a master's type program in which I had to take seven classes before leaving for Mexico, then prepare a thesis after a return to Atlanta, then teach classes in pre-Columbian architecture while I remained at Georgia Tech. My story begins in the winter quarter of my sophomore year at Georgia Tech School of Architecture. I notice a note on the bulletin board advertising for a volunteer student to prepare site plans for the famous archaeologist Arthur Kelly. The site was on the Chattahoochee River southwest of Atlanta where they were excavating a very ancient town in the midst of the construction of the Great Southwest Industrial Park. They needed a student to do an ink on mylar site plan. The archaeological zone consisted of multiple village and town sites that were occupied from roughly 450 BC till around 1825 AD. At the time that I was making contact with these people, they were excavating the lowest village, which dated back to around 450 BC through 250 AD. Dr. Kelly was director of the Anthropology Project Department at the University of Georgia, but most of the the professors and the students working on this archaeological site were from Georgia State University. Therefore, Dr. Kelly asked me to come to downtown Atlanta for an interview at Georgia State University. Samples of my ink work from architecture design projects at Georgia Tech far exceeded the skill level needed for Dr. Kelly's work. So the interview went by very quickly. Then we went on to discuss what was being discovered along the Chattahoochee River. It was fascinating. There was a cluster of Native American artifacts in the center of the table. Dr. Kelly explained that they were looking at artifacts from the Chattahoochee River Valley, which appeared to be either made in Mexico, probably southern Mexico, or else copies of Mesoamerican artifacts. I thought that was fascinating, but didn't quite uh, understand what... There were several bowls and cups on the table, but what really caught my attention were some cylindrical ceramic seals are used for making uh, tattoos on bodies and for marking pottery. They weren't quite as complex as ones I'd seen on a National Geographic special on the Mayas, but they obviously were closely related to Mesoamerica. I think they were onto something. Now, I was just a sophomore in architecture school, so I knew nothing about either Mexican pottery or Southeastern Native American pottery. So I had just had to take the word of the professors, although I did notice that the, the ones they zeroed in as being possibly from Mexico did look different than other pottery in the room that came from Georgia. Dr. Kelly stated that most of the artifacts on the center of the table came from the lower Chattahoochee River, the lower Flint River, or the vicinity of Atapogos, Georgia. We now know that these cylindrical seals are almost identical to those made by the Olmec civilization, as, as it's called, and by ethnic groups living in the periphery of the Olmec civilization. But that was not known back in 1969. However, he had found 
figurines and pieces of figurines that he also thought were similar to those from southern Mexico. As you can see, this one does seem to have the same type of feeling as a typical figurine from southern Mexico. A few weeks later, John S. Pennington, a popular writer for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, interviewed Dr. Kelly about his discovery of what appeared to be Mesoamerican artifacts on the Chattahoochee River. This was a very popular article in the Atlanta Journal Constitution and immediately brought the ire of all of his peers, or at least most of his peers in the archaeological profession. Arthur Kelly was a supervising archaeologist for what is still the largest archaeological project ever carried out in the United States. So his opinion on the artifacts should have carried a lot of weight, but such was not the case. Several professors at the University of Georgia and at other southeastern anthropological schools began to conspire to get rid of Kelly and to discredit his, his statements about a Mesoamerican presence in Georgia. This ultimately culminated in December of 1969 with Kelly being forced to resign from the faculty of the University of Georgia. For the rest of his life, he was a pariah among most archaeologists in Georgia and ignored although he still had a good reputation in other parts of the United States. So in the autumn of 1969, when Dr. Kelly was embroiled in a behind-the-scenes catfight with his fellow archaeologists, I was preparing the proposal for the Barrett Fellowship, the very first Barrett Fellowship. My faculty advisor, Ike Sporta, was a friend of Dr. Kelly and suggested that my research question be specifically a search for the similarities between the indigenous architecture of Georgia and the indigenous architecture of some section of Mexico. We did not know where he would be at that time. My proposal was completed the day after Dr. Kelly's last day at the University of Georgia. There's some irony in that. If you'd like to know the full story of how I received the first Barrett Fellowship, Go to the People of One Fire channel program, The Secrets Above Tetuacan, Part 1. I also had to deal with academic politics, but in a whole different level of concern. We will jump in the story described in The Secrets Above Tetuacan to July 6, 1970, when I'm in the office of Dr. Ramon Pina Chan. For the first time, he was curator of the Museo Nacional de Antropología and the coordinator of my fellowship in Mexico. In 1968, Dr. Pina Chan published the book La Cultura Madre, which is about the Olmec civilization. At that time, the Mexican archaeologists were still trying to get people to stop using the word Olmec. His book was expanded and changed its title to Los Olmecas, La Cultura Madre, and was republished in 1989. Very early in our initial orientation meeting, Dr. Pinchan told me something that very few people in North America know about. The Olmecs had nothing to do with the Olmec civilization. They were a Nahuan people who entered the region of Tabasco and southern Veracruz probably around 1000 to 1100 AD, which is roughly 1,500 years after the collapse of the so-called Olmec civilization. As was customary in Latin American academia, I gave Dr. Pena Chan two books at the close of our tour of the facilities at the museum. I then bade him farewell. However, he started thumbing through the books while I was waiting on a bus out in front of the museum and then sent his assistant to bring me back into the museum to have lunch with him. He was fascinated by sun circles and human hands. Uh, he had no idea of the sophistication of the, uh, the, particularly the copper work at Etowah Mounds. And so we spent lunch and became the beginning of a, a friendship between the two of us. What immediately caught the eye of Dr. Pena Chan were photographs in the uh, Sun Circles book of the famous marble statues at Etowah Mounds. His first comment to me was roughly, uh, Ricardo, why did your Indians in Georgia make marble statues of Maya slaves? Hmm. Archaeological textbooks and, and magazine articles published in the United States 
tend to give the impression that all the major discoveries in Mexico were made by archaeologists from North America. That is simply not true. The pioneering work was done by Leopoldo Batres, who was the first professional archaeologist from Mexico. He first became aware of a very early culture in southern Mexico in the early 1900s and presented a study of what he had found down there in 1914. But unfortunately, it was at the height of the Mexican Revolution, and so the only news coming out of Mexico was about the fighting going on, and, and so the general public outside of Mexico never knew about his studies. North American archaeologist Franz Blum and Olivier Lafarge did eventually learn about this report from Batras, and in 1924 went down to southern Mexico to excavate the region where Batras thought there was a very early civilization. The first detailed descriptions of La Venta and San Martin Payapan Monument One was presented in 1925 after the expedition down there. However, at the time, most archaeologists assumed that the Olmec were contemporaries with the Mayas. Even Bloom and Lafarge were, in their own words, inclined to subscribe them to Maya culture. Following their footsteps, Mexican archaeologists uh, Alfonso Caso, just out of graduate school, began working in the same region that the two Americans had been working. He coined the term La Cultura Madre for the unknown civilization in the South. The two Americans had called it the Olmec civilization because there was an Olmec tribe living in the region at the time of Spanish conquest. North American archaeologist Matthew Sterling, who you'll learn a little bit more about later, was the first uh, North American archaeologists that begin to suspect there was an earlier ethnic group in the Maya region. He began working there in 1938. In counterpoint to Sterling, Covarrubias, and Alfonso Caso, however, Mayanists J. Eric Thompson and Silvus Morley argued for a classic area dates for the Olmec artifacts being found down there, which would place it roughly from 200 to 900 AD. The question of Olmec chronology came to head at a 1942 Tuxla Gutierrez conference where Alfonso Caso declared that the Olmecs were the mother culture, La Cultura Madre, of Mesoamerica. Shortly after the conference, radiocarbon dating proved the antiquity of the Olmec civilization, although the mother culture question generated considerable debate for even 60 years later. In the late 1940s, Mexican archaeologists Ignacio Bernal and Roman Pinachan began working at times in southern Mexico and also finding evidence that there was an earlier culture before the, the Mayas. Uh, interesting enough, both of those men were to be my co-sponsors and coordinators of my fellowship in Mexico. However, about five minutes through our tour of the, the National Museum, Ignacio Bernal realized that I was A, not from a rich gringo family, B, not a professional architect, but an architecture student, and C, uh, was just beginning to learn Spanish, and so he walked away from the tour, and I never saw him again. Ramon Pinachon took on 100% of the responsibilities of coordinating my activities in Mexico after that point. Both men published books on the Olmec civilization immediately prior to the 1968 Olympics that were held in Mexico City. Ramon Pinachon's book emphasized more that the name of these people were not Olmec, because in fact the Olmecs were later invaders of the region, probably driving out many of the, the descendants of the original inhabitants. But the name Olmec stuck, even though the Olmecs had nothing to do with the civilization. The book by Ramon Pinachon, my actual coordinator, is tended to be viewed as the, the more uh, scientific and and current in its interpretation of the Olmec civilization. Matthew Sterling became chief of the Bureau of Ethnology of the Smithsonian Institute in 1928. He'd had some interest in the earliest cultures in Mexico before then, but really did not go to Mexico specifically to study them until 1938. Sterling examined several sites that had already been excavated by Caso. And, and read his reports, uh, obtained English translations, and then returned to Washington, D.C. to the Smithsonian and gave a lecture on what he had discovered in Mexico, giving the impression that he was the one that had excavated the giant heads 
and some of the other th items of the Olmec civilization that we've now be become uh, synonymous with the Olmec culture. On that first trip to Mexico, Matthew Sterling was accompanied by his lovely wife, Marion, who began as a secretary to him in 1933, but they eventually fell in love and married. She would be with him on all but two of the expeditions to Mexico uh, and became an archeologist in her own right by the end of the process. During the first two years of World War II, the Sterlings were not able to go back to Mexico after initially working there two years, but after World War II, uh, they began to concentrate their work and did develop the chronology, which later proved be correct, to show that the so-called Olmec civilization predated the Maya civilization. In the 21st century, advancements in technology has enabled archaeologists to drastically push back the dates associated with the so-called Olmec civilization. As of today, these are the, this is the chronology of that period of culture in Mexico. 5,500 to 1,800 BC, experimental domestication of indigenous plants. 2,500 to 1,000 BC, importation of domesticated plants from other regions. 1800 BC, probable arrival of another ethnic group to southern Mexico. 1700 BC, establishment of permanent agricultural villages. 1200 to 900 BC, arrival of another ethnic group, carving of most of the stone heads and some villages grown, growing into towns. 1000 BC, construction begins on larger mounds and pottery appears. Note that pottery appeared in southern Mexico approximately 1,500 years after it appeared in Georgia. 500 BC, several large towns are abandoned. 500 BC to 200 AD, the epi olmec period, which was actually a more advanced civilization technologically than the Olmec civilization, except they did not build large mounds. I arrived in Tabasco during the third week of August, 1970, and as I went out into the compost or the countryside, I immediately noticed earth forms made by man that reminded me of the southeastern United States. Here is where I began to really see architecture and site planning that obviously was connected somehow to what developed later on in the southeastern United States, and particularly in Georgia. But it would take many years before all the answers would come to me. Much was yet to be learned about both the Creeks and the people who created the Olmec civilization. Basically what I could say when I wrote my report on the, uh, the fellowship was that I found earthworks in Tabasco and southern Veracruz that were very similar to those in Georgia. But I really couldn't go any further. I had nothing to go by as far as, as the details of the various civilizations in each area. This aerial photograph is of Laguna de los Cerros in the southern tip of Veracruz. Now, in the 21st century, my studies of the creeks continued and I was able to find eyewitness drawings by William Bartram, which show that the earthworks are identical in the two locations, the Proto Creek towns in Georgia and many of the so-called Olmec towns in southern Mexico. Here you see a comparison of the, the large Olmec city of La Venta compared to the layout of the Creek town of Coweta in central Georgia in 1776. Also during the past 20 years, I've been able to photograph many examples of Proto-Creek art at various museums in the southeast, particularly in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. In particular, the statuary produced by the commoners and middle-class people in southern Mexico were quite similar to the types of statuary found in Georgia. Now, in Mexico, you seldom see these artworks by the commoners, but you can see them in the back storage rooms of, of uh, museums where I often had access. The copper ornaments and artifacts found at Etowah Mounds in particular are quite similar, if not identical, to their counterparts 
in several Oma sites in southern Mexico and also in some of the western and southern Maya cities where they might be gold instead of copper. In fact, there is a stone carving of a priest dressed as an eagle dancer at Chichen Itza in northern Yucatan that has almost identical details to a copper plate found at Etowah Mounds in Georgia. This was pointed out by the chief archaeologist of Chichen Itza in the premiere of the History Channel series America on Earth. Also in the art of the lower southeast, particularly in eastern Tennessee and Georgia, one can see pubic guards, which contain symbols which are really part of the Maya syllabary or the Maya glyphs. They have the, probably have the same meaning in both regions. The biggest piece of the jigsaw puzzle would not occur until 2015. That's when, after many years of research and searching, I discovered the missing Creek migration legends, eh? the original handwritten documents prepared by colonial secretary Thomas Christie, based on the translations by the famous Creek woman Mary Musgrove. Several, in fact, most of these migration legends describe journeys either by water or by land from southern Mexico to what is now the state of Georgia. There was no doubt about it. The bulk of the tribes that made up the Creek Confederacy came from the very same region where the so-called Olmec civilization rose around 1500 BC. There's one more piece of intriguing graphic evidence. The Cascal tablet or block was found at a construction site in the 1990s, but was not analyzed by anthropologists until around 2006. They came to the conclusion, this is an example, the earliest known example of a writing system in Mexico. Let's take it the regions where the so-called Olmec civilization rose. That's one thing we should emphasize. In fact, it was not one homogenous civilization as such, but a group of regions where similar cultures rose, each of them focusing on a major town. For example, the, the large city of La Benta, which is a Spanish name, was located in tidal marshes very close to the Gulf of Mexico on an island. Uh, in fact, the area around there originally was a series of islands surrounded by marshes. But other towns of varying sizes were located in entirely different environments. Some were more akin to, say, the Piedmont here in the southeast. Others were built near mountains. Others were built in the mountains, each one having its own influence area. Approximately at the point where the city of Laventa developed, the brine water changes to freshwater marshes and freshwater ponds. The brine water tidal marshes of the state of Tabasco are no different in appearance than those seen along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, or perhaps near Apalachicola, Florida. Further inland in, in Tabasco, uh, Florida, the coast of Georgia, and South Carolina can be found freshwater marshes and freshwater lakes. Both areas, they look uh, virtually identical. Moving farther inland in both regions, one comes upon a, a terrain of gently rolling hills and red clay. Uh, the southeast United States does not have an exclusive on red clay. The vegetation there is jungle-like in both regions. The primary difference being that the trees growing in southern Mexico will be uh, composed of tropical climate trees, whereas those in the southeastern coastal plain would be characterized by either wet temperate or semi-tropical species. Let's take a look at Laguna de los Cerros, which is a Olmec town in the hill country of southern Veracruz, where the original scenes of the Cachita Creek migration legend began. Interesting enough, it has many, many copper artifacts in its soil. Pyramid A at Laguna de los Cerros is no difference in composition or in, in appearance than many so-called mounds in the United States, which really are just earthen pyramids. What's really interesting though about this site though is that the Pyramid A 
At the Olmec town site is very similar to the original appearance of Mound Day in Etowah, which is also known for its copper artifacts. We can't be sure the same people lived in both towns, but that does begin to make one think there was cultural connections between the, the two places. Perhaps the most famous Olmec civilization city was La Benta, which was located in Tabasco State uh, at the edge of the tidal marshes. It originally was built on an island, but uh, over time the land around it has been drained and uh, filled in to produce agricultural soil. There were still large areas of water when I visited La Venta in 1970. La Venta was constructed on a two square mile island at the edge between the saltwater marshes and the freshwater marshes, about 10 miles inland from the Gulf of Mexico. La Venta was first settled as a small agricultural village around the year 1200 BC. The village began to grow rapidly around 900 BC and by 800 BC was becoming one of the dominant towns in the southern Mexico region. Originally it would appear to have been uh, surrounded by shallow water on all sides, perhaps it was a cause of connecting with other islands, but that has changed in recent years. When I visited La Venta in 1970, uh, it was partially surrounded by water, but today on most sides it's either farmland or a town has grown up next to the ruins that catering to the tourist traffic. All the significant bodies of water have been drained in the past 50 years. The current appearance of La Venta dates from its last occupation between 600 and 400 BC. It's this architectural tradition which continued to be constructed in Georgia until the late 1700s. One of the earliest pyramids known in Mesoamerica, the Great Pyramid of La Venta, is 110 feet or 34 meters high and contains an estimated 100,000 cubic meters of air fill. It is approximately the same size as the Monk's Mound at Cahokia, Illinois. The current conical shape of the pyramid was once thought to represent nearby volcanoes or mountains, but recent work by Rebecca Gonzalez Locke a architect and anthropologist has shown that the pyramid was in fact a rectangular pyramid with step sides and inset corners and the current shape is most likely to due to 2500 years of erosion. The pyramid itself has never been excavated but a magnometer survey in 1967 found an anomaly high on the south side of the pyramid. Speculation ranges from a section of burned clay to a catch of beard offerings has caused this anomaly. Unlike later Maya and Aztec cities, La Venta, like most of the other Olmec cities and towns, was built from earthy clay. There was very little locally abundant stone for the construction of buildings in the town. Large basalt stones were brought from the Tutsla Mountains by raft along major rivers, but these were used nearly exclusively for monuments including the colossal heads, the altars, the thrones and various stelae. For example, the basalt columns that surround Complex A in La, in La Venta were carved from the Punta Roca Partido on the Gulf Coast north of San Andreas Tusa Volcano. A little more than half of the ancient city survived modern disturbances enough to be mapped accurately. Today, the entire southern end of the site is covered by a petroleum refinery and has been largely demolished, making the excavations difficult or impossible. Many of the site's monuments are now on display at the Archaeological Museum and Park in the city of Fijamosa, Tabasco. As you can see in this map, dense urbanization now has crept up to the very boundaries of the archaeological zone, which takes away from the quality of the site visiting it. We're now going to take a look at several of the better known artistic creations unearthed by archaeologists in Olmec civilization cities. This particular one appears to be a, a scribe working inside of a cave, although it's also been interpreted by Eric von Donneken in the late 20th century as a, a extraterrestrial astronaut. This appears to be a primitive form of hominid, like Homo erectus, perhaps a chimpanzee, that has been captured and bound to a pole. This is quite controversial as the actual interpretation. Some people interpret this as being an African, but to me it looks 
much more like an ape than it does a human. Now here's another video I took from the other side of the sculpture. You can see the face more clearly, it's more focused on the face. It really doesn't look human to me at all. When you look at a view of a photograph taken farther away from the sculpture, you notice he's looking up to the sky. I think that's very odd too. It's like it's looking up into the heavens where it came from. This is one of several stone mosaic paving patterns. At La Venta, they essentially carved out bricks from stone and, and made uh, various geometric patterns with it. We have several examples we'll be showing you today. Here's another site there at La Venta. Um, different colored rocks, more of a reddish colored and not quite as well fabricated, but again, it's a, it's a complex ge geometric form. These are obviously not paving stones. It appears to have been a pattern created by standing short sections of, of rock columns, or it could be these were tall columns and they've collapsed through the years. It's not possible now to say they, the way they scattered about the landscape. This isn't an altar or perhaps a throne. It displays a noble sitting, it appears to be the opening of a building or perhaps a cave. It's hard to say, but it's a recreation of, a, of an architectural form carved out of a single monolithic stone. This altar is very similar, but it's not quite the same as the previous one. There, there are subtle differences in the details, even though the priest in the center is, is sitting in the, in the same pattern. Here's a side and rear view of another altar. Now it's possible that it did function as a throne, but that the, the leader sat cross-legged on top of the throne rather than sat in a chair. That's always a possibility. This is the first of several giant Olmec heads, as they're known, that we'll be looking at today. They have a different facial feature than the smaller sculptures and other types of Olmec art. You'll notice as we go through the program. Most of these giant sculptures, including this one, the man is wearing a helmet. It's never been fully decided whether the helmet was for the great best American ball game or for warfare. Tresopota is considered the most beautiful of the Olmec civilization city sites. It's in the, the Twitzla Mountains of southern Veracruz. It is the most northerly of the major Olmec city sites and is definitely in the region where several branches of the upper creeks originated. We know that from the migration legends. Founded as an agricultural village in the centuries before 1000 BC, Tresipotas emerged as a regional center early in the middle formative period, perhaps around 900-800 BC, roughly coinciding with the decline of San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan. The earliest public architecture yet detected has been dated to the end of the middle formative, perhaps around 500 BC. Unlike the city of La Venta, Tresipotas were not abandoned at the close of the middle formative period, or about 400 BC, nor was it immediately affected by the collapse of the Olmec culture in the eastern Olmec heartland. However, during the next several hundred years, the Olmec culture at Tresipotas and on the western edge of the Olmec heartland evolved in what has come to be called the Epi-Olmec or the Veracruz culture. Most of the monumental sculpture at Tresipotas is Epi-Olmec dating from the late formative period, uh, or roughly around 400 BC to 200 AD. These sculptures show, as do the Tresipotes ceramics, a continuity with and a gradual change away from traditional Olmec patterns. It was during this epi-Olmec period that a new Mesoamerican writing system appeared at Tresipotes. Ispian or epi script, as well as some of the earliest dates in the long count of the Maya calendar. Although the classic era, starting roughly 300 AD, saw continued mound construction and the appearance of, of actual stone architectural details, Tresipotas remained a regional center. The era nevertheless brought a perceptible decline in Tresipotas' relative fortunes as the centers of the new classic Veracruz sculpture grew in prominence and size to the north. Tresipotas may have been abandoned by 900 AD, although there was smaller and later occupations periodically up to the time of Spanish occupation. What you find interesting though is that even though these stone heads and 
larger stone cultures or maintained the appearance of an Australoid or, or a more primitive looking human, they nevertheless became much later than the, the types of sculptures seen elsewhere in the lower portion of Mexico. TV documentaries on the Olmec civilization always seem to make statements such as, why did the Olmec civilization vanish? Well, it didn't. Some of the cities were abandoned during a certain period of time, but others continued to thrive, and in fact, new cities appeared in the same region. It's just their culture changed. This fact is not made clear in these documentaries. One of the cities that was founded after the population collapsed at La Benta is Aquata Phoenix, also in Tabasco. It does have a different characteristic uh, as far as site planning goes when compared to the earlier Olmec civilization towns, but in, in no sense it is a primitive town at all. In fact, it shows great sophistication in the layout of the, the plazas and the pyramids. One thing came very clear to me when I re-examined my color slides and fill notes and my journal from those days on the fellowship so long ago. There was more than one ethnic group involved with the Olmec civilization. It's very clear. There may have been as many as five and perhaps three races. The art of the Olmec civilization displays many different physiological features, distinctly different ones. They could only become from different ethnic groups, perhaps even different types of hominids there in southern Mexico during the time of its, its uh, highest peak of civilization. We'll now take a look at the artistic portrayal of the people who lived in southern Mexico during that period of time. Perhaps the most controversial is the ethnic identity of the people who inspired the great stone heads. Take a look at these photograph. It is very clear in this comparison, this slide, you can see that there are still today Native Americans whose facial features match the great stone heads of the Olmec civilization. They were not a lost race. Their descendants live in the Americas today. I am convinced that there was a remnant Homo erectus or pre-Homo sapien population living in southern Mexico at the time of the beginning of the Olmec civilization that continued to exist for some time despite being persecuted and hunted, perhaps even eaten, by the Homo sapiens there in southern Mexico. Their facial features are there in the art. Perhaps even the great stone heads portray peoples who are mixed Homo erectus and Homo sapien background. Now we come to one more interesting aspects of the Olmec civilization art. Many of the figurines portray a, a human physical type with an oversized skull and a, like a jar-like cranium that extends far above where normal humans today have their skulls. Interesting enough, forensic artist Marcia K. Moore has reconstructed a hybrid Paracas skull from Peru and come up with a physical features that are identical to these figurines in southern Mexico. Obviously, the same type of hybrid human beings were in southern Mexico and in western Peru and was associated with the rise of both of the early civilizations in those regions. Members of the Flabloco tribal town of the Muscogee Creek Nation are descended from the Soki people who lived in northeast Georgia. Here you can clearly see that they maintain very similar features to early Olmec civilization art, both in terms of the large heads and of figuring and statues. During the period that the ancestors of the Soki participated in the Olmec civilization, however, the artists also portrayed members of the community with, with European faces and with full beards. You can see all three of these characters had beards. Then we'd also find uh, statues of people with a parac hybrid Paracas heads, but also wearing beards, which, which suggests that maybe there were many different ethnic groups blending together that created the modern appearance of the Soki and other Southern Mexican peoples. They were, they were not just one race even. Some Olmec civilization statues even have headdresses that were quite similar to those worn by the nobility of ancient Egypt. 
Let's look at some of the stella or, or vertical stone monuments you find in the uh, Olmec civilization towns. The earliest ones are basically stone columns, but then later they became more and more ornate and by the end strongly resemble the stella being erected in Maya towns. Here's another view of the people with oversized bottle-shaped craniums. You get a close-up view of their face. Here is a bottle head baby. This is either a deformed person or perhaps a baby of the ethnic group that, that the Great Stone Heads was modeled about. This is a child that perhaps had Down syndrome or else it's a, it's another ethnic group that made up the Olmec civilization. On the left appears to be an Australoid or Polynesian uh, teenage girl. On the right, possibly an Australoid is not clear what it is. This statue appears to be that of a scribe or ruler wearing the a headdress very similar to the ones worn by the nobility and scribes of Egypt. This is a large ceramic column portraying the rain god Tlaloc. Notice the goggle-like appearance of his eyes. That's typical of all of Mesoamerica. This ceramic statue appears to portray a so soaky man holding a squash. This stone statue appears to portray a American Indian man holding a baby or perhaps a fish with a human face. It's not quite clear. Here are two more squads wearing Egyptian type headdresses. This is the ancient god of fire. Notice that he has a goatee type beard, not a full beard. The ceramic sculpture appears to be a boy or a man resting on his knee, perhaps asleep. The ceramic sculpture appears to be a bottlehead man, perhaps at a meeting. There's probably a, a certain symbolism to the holding of one's left arm with the right hand. This head here is in an artistic style, more typical of Tetuacan, but Tetuacan post-dates the Olmec civilization, so we're not sure what that actually means. It was a style of art more commonly seen in central Mexico during that period but also sometimes found in southern Mexico, it's called Omicoid. It's a stylistic type in which the slanted eyes are overemphasized and they wear those odd-looking caps. There's so much we don't know about that period of time yet because such things as cloth caps have not survived the, the thousand, 2,000 years, 3,000 years from when they were made and where we are today. They do not show up generally in archaeological digs. By the end of the Epi Olmec period, the art in southern Mexico strongly resembled what most people, uh, especially laymans, would call Maya art. But what actually happened was that the two cultures blended together as they evolved, and, and much of what we now think of as being Maya, such as the counting system and, and this bas relief type of art, actually originated with the late Olmec or Epi-Olmec civilization. At the end of the Epi-Olmec period, a culture developed in the marshes of Tabasco, which was not even discussed in the museum in Mexico City when I was on a fellowship there. And in fact, until very recently, you could not find any information on these people in common references, whether they be online or in text. They were the Choiti or the Chantal Mayas. It is now believed that they were from originally from a lower area of Central America, perhaps Nicaragua, Panama, one of those, those countries, and then they migrated northward into the coastal region. They definitely were not the same pure 
Maya ethnicity that you would find, say, in the highlands of Guatemala. Yet, more so than any other culture that I studied while in Mexico, these Chantal Mayas show a direct cultural connection with the ancestors of the Creek and Seminole Indians in the Southeast. There's strong similarities in many of their cultural traditions and their architecture. For example, the Native American name of the town that was preceded Helen, Georgia, was Choiti, which the same people who were in Tabasco. That means there was a body of Choiti refugees at some time in the past who went along the edge of the Gulf of Mexico or else sailed across it, went up the Chattahoochee River and went to its source, which is now, of course, the Alpine village of Helen. I first became vaguely aware of the Chantal Mayas when visiting the Vijamosa Museum of Archaeology and History. It is now just the History Museum. There's a brand new archaeology museum. In that museum was an exhibit of artifacts which looked very much like the ones that Dr. Arthur Kelly had shown me one day when I was up in the Department of Anthropology at Georgia State University. And of course, I was just a young architecture student, not an archaeologist, but by that time I'd been intensely studying the cultures of Mexico and looking at thousands of artifacts throughout Mexico, so I was somewhat knowledgeable on the subject, and clearly these seemed to be the same people that Dr. Kelly had discovered on the Chattahoochee River. So I paid closer attention to the exhibits there in view most of the perhaps typical tourists would, and what I learned was the Chantal Mayas had developed a culture on the islands in the marshes of Tabasco that evolved into them becoming the master mariners of the Americas. They became the key traders for the Mesoamerican civilizations and their boats spanned the distance of their known world. Thus it makes perfect sense for your Chantal Mayas to be the ones who made initial contact in the southeastern United States. This model was on display in the museum and described as, as a typical Chantal Maya town. As it turns out, the layout of it is fairly accurate, but the architecture is not. We'd learn more about that later, actually in the next century. Because what happened was, when I got back to Mexico City after Tabasco and had my last meeting with Dr. Ramon Pina Chan, I asked him about the Chantal Mayas and he basically shrugged his shoulders and didn't tell me much of anything, like they weren't even worth studying. And that's how he left it. As we went on through the years, I really knew nothing about them. In fact, to date, there's only been one person who's devoted a significant amount of time into researching the Chantal Mayas. His name is Douglas T. Peck, and his background was a World War II veteran, an aviator, who in 1990 translated his love of sailing into rediscovering the actual routes used by the early Spanish explorers of Florida. And that interest evolved during the 1990s into the voyages of what he thought were the Maya traders who originally arrived in Florida and then Georgia, the Chantel Mayas. He did all the research that now we find in the references about the Chantal Mayas, that it was impossible to find anything about them until Doug came along. And again, he was not an anthropologist or even a historian. He was a mariner that gradually altered his interest into studying the early Maya explorations of the Southeast. There's one important difference, though, between Doug's experiences and those most people of his non professional background. Very soon, his research, both in terms of the Spanish history of Florida and the travels of the Chantal Mayas, were accepted in toto by the professional archaeologists of Florida and were printed in their journals. And that's the main source of finding his research is the official archaeological bulletins of Florida. Doug contacted me in 2003 after seeing a PBS program which mentioned my experiments in applying architectural software to studying and describing archaeological sites. 
He had sketches and technical descriptions of several types of Chantal Maya boats and needed someone to convert them into precise drawings that I could do. And that's how we started our relationship. We stayed friends throughout the time he, he was alive. He died a few years later. But in the process, I also learned a great deal about the Chantal Mayas from Doug, which I've applied to my own research as we continue to unravel the history of the Southeast. That is the reason that in many ways, between Doug Peck and myself, we know much more about the Chantal Mayas than the typical North American archaeologists. We seem to be the only two people outside of Mexico who knew that the Chantal Mayas learned how to build boats out of planks. They were, their seagoing vessels were built exactly like a Viking longboat, but actually predated the longboat. There's one more very important assistance that Doug gave me. He was able to obtain a archaeological port from the Institución Nacional de Antropología and Historia Mexico, which described a Chantal Maya town. And I was able to develop that with the architectural software into a complete understanding of what these original towns look like. They're quite a bit different than the model in the museum in Vejamosa. But as you can see, they strongly resembled the ancestral Creek Indian towns of Georgia, northern Florida, eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, and Alabama. Thus, we had a direct architectural link between a culture in Mexico and the Creek Indians in Georgia, something that I was seeking to find many years ago when I was on that first Barrett Fellowship. This program has actually asked many more questions than it's answered, but that is the nature of the situation today in southern Mexico. I don't think we still really understand what was going on back in the early days of the cultural advancement in southern Mexico. We certainly know more than we did 50 years ago when I was on the first Barrett Fellowship, but again, I don't think we're beginning to understand what happened there, who came there, and how civilization that was quite unique from that of the areas of on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean would arise. But that gives time for the future, for future generations, to rethink the evidence that we have and maybe come up with better interpretations than our current generation have. We shall see what happens in the future.